In the center of Brazil's flag is a blue disc, emblazoned with the Southern Cross and the national adage, Order and Progress. These words signal Brazil's great power aspirations. And with the extensive mineral deposits, natural wonders like the Amazon, and roughly half of South America's landmass and population, few would deny the country's geopolitical potential. But Brazil is not for beginners, a fact concealed by a simple glance at the map. The country's landscape is rough, uneven, and ill-suited to economic development. And despite sporadic efforts at industrialization, Brazil remains wedded to an extractive economic model. Perhaps even more troubling is its fragmented internal politics, which opens avenues for foreign interference and subversion. So what makes Brazil tick? And why is this supposed land of the future still shackled to its past? Like most people, I have my own morning rituals. After a hot drink, I usually browse the news. But the sheer amount of useless content on social media can be distracting. Morning Brew, the sponsor of today's video, is the app I've come to rely on. It gets me up to speed on politics, finance and tech in just 5 minutes. For example, recently a massive leak of classified Pentagon documents contains references to countries all over the world. But the leak also reveals Washington snooping on its allies, including Brazil. Clearly, Brazil isn't happy with this. Back in 2013, the NSA leaks did substantial harm to US interests in Brazil. Interestingly, many of the allied nations are playing down the leak as rogue disinformation. No one wants to burn bridges with America. But either way, it is America's worst intelligence breach in a decade. In just a few paragraphs, I got precisely what I needed. Morning Brew is free, informative and takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe. Sign up for free by using morningbrewdaily.com slash Caspian or click the link in the description. Close to Africa and equidistant from Europe and North America, Brazil's central location played a defining role in its global geo-economic significance. In 1494, Spain and Portugal split their New World claims with the Treaty of Tortesilias handing the Brazilian coast to Lisbon. Yet the development potential of this land was not immediately obvious. Its mountainous coastline held a natural beauty, but its lack of coastal plains and dense vegetation made it an uninviting destination for settlement. Lisbon thus doled out land grants to wealthy Portuguese hoping they would bear the immense costs of land clearing and building infrastructures that could climb the coastal escarpments to the inland plains. But in business, nature and human life is cheap. Whatever development took place formed around economies of scale, especially cash crops with a high value to weight ratio like sugar. Colonial violence and European pathogens soon wiped out local indigenous peoples, and this led to the settlers to import nearly 6 million enslaved Africans over the next 350 years to make up the plantation labor force. The natural result was an oligarchic society with a large Afro-Brazilian underclass, which today accounts for half of Brazil's population. Dependence on monoculture exports also generated powerful agribusiness lobbies such that upon independence, the federal government treated their priorities as its own. Brazil thus became tied to the commodities cycle. Industries like Amazonian rubber and Sao Paulo coffee would boom only to go bust when faced with a global downturn. Worse, the geographic concentration of the lobbies spread regionalism, as different industries jostled for federal patronage. But quantity has a quality of its own, and the fact that Brazil avoided fragmentation that befell Spanish America meant that it became a regional leader almost by default. 
modern Brazil dominates the continent, bordering every South American state except for Chile and Ecuador. And these borders are reinforced by geographic fortifications, including the northern Amazon, the western Andes, and the southwestern Pantanal swamplands. This gave Brazil the cover needed to expand onto the Cerrado, a Greenland-sized tropical savanna containing most of its arable land. But going from colony to great power was not easy. Developing the Cerrado region was especially problematic. Its acidic soils require terraforming to produce conventional crops, and though it borders the Rio de la Plata river system, access to the estuary rivers is limited since Brazil's borders generally terminate above the point where the rivers become commercially navigable. This inflates transport costs, since shipments must travel to the narrow coastal plains where port infrastructure is possible. The resulting bottlenecks leaves ports like Santos, the largest in South America, prone to congestion. And the elevated interior also poses obstacles to developing national infrastructures, imposing geographic fragmentation and further exacerbating regionalism. Even so, crisis has occasionally spurred Brazil to attempt to overcome these constraints. Collapsing global markets in the 1930s induced a payment crisis, but it also weakened agribusiness lobbies, allowing Brazil's autocratic leader Getulio Vargas to pursue industrial development based on import substitution. His economic nationalist prescriptions included domestic subsidies, import quotas, and tariffs to shield Brazilian industries from foreign competition. Though these policies stemmed the payments outflows, higher consumer prices spurred inflation. The attempts of subsequent democratic governments to impose austerity proved unpopular, and by the 1950s, macroeconomic stability was deprioritized in favor of infrastructure development, including building a new capital at Brasilia. The plan succeeded in developing the interior, but in the short run, it pushed up inflation and ballooned the foreign debt. Ultimately though, in 1964, the old political guard opposed these policies and conspired with the military and the US Embassy to overthrow President Jean Goulart when he proposed tax increases, nationalizations and land redistribution. The military dictatorship that followed implemented austerity, cut imports, expanded exports, and allowed foreign capital. While the economy stalled for years, by the 1970s, state-led industrialization began paying dividends. Cerrado Clearing began to make bulk cereal exports viable, and the relative decline of Argentina allowed Brazil to convert neighboring Bolivia, Paraguay, and Uruguay into economic satellites. However, Industrialization also induced mass migration of peasants to the urban centers in the east, causing mass unemployment. The policy response after the return of democracy in 1985 was to treat the Amazon as an economic release valve. Vast territories of rainforest were cleared for exploitation, while new peasant settlements were established to encourage demographic migration. In the process, a patchwork of rainforest the size of California was stripped to the bone between 1970 and 2007. But that wasn't the end of it. The discovery of the Tupi pre-salt oil field in 2006 reinforced the tension between ecological order and economic progress. As the largest hydrocarbon discovery in the Western Hemisphere in the last 30 years, it contained 8 billion barrels of recoverable oil, allowing Brazil to become a top oil producer. But the discovery also attracted unwanted political intrigue. In 2009, President Lula da Silva steered disquiet in Washington when he made the state company Petrobras the chief operator on the offshore oil blocks and partnered with the Chinese oil firm Sinopec while sidelining American multinationals. 
Relations with Lula's successor, Dilma Rousseff, soured further when the 2013 NSA leaks revealed Washington was spying on the president's office and Petrobras. The faith of the oil blocs was ultimately determined by Brazil's fractious internal politics. In 2016, Rousseff was ousted in a congressional coup under the pretext of alleged corruption and budget misappropriation. Her replacement, Michel Temer, immediately announced a public asset sell-off to raise revenue, including concessions for airports, roads, railways and the offshore oil blocks, mostly to foreign interests, thus undermining Brazil's economic sovereignty. Temer also reopened the Amazon to deforestation, and under his successor, Jair Bolsonaro, deforestation of the Amazon accelerated once more. This time, however, it generated global backlash, causing a trade deal between the European Union and the Mercosur trade bloc to stall. Playing up his environmental credentials, Lula gathered enough domestic and international legitimacy to win a second stint as president and his recent diplomatic endeavors suggest Brazil may be poised for a geopolitical comeback. But most crucial is Brazil's relationship with Argentina. The two recently announced plans to develop a common trade currency for cross-border payments. Doing so would reduce the dampening effect on Argentina's chronic dollar shortage on bilateral trade while opening up the Rio de la Plata river system and its favorable geography to Brazilian commerce. Should the currency gain traction, other Latin American countries may follow suit. Such a challenge to the US dollar is in keeping with Lula's independent-minded foreign policy, which prioritizes global outreach. During his first term, Lula engaged Iran, opposed the Iraq war and formed BRICS with Russia, India, China and South Africa. Like his current neutrality on the Ukraine conflict, this has won Lula many admirers in the global south, but few friends in Washington. In particular, relations between Brasilia and Beijing have drawn closer. Since 2009, China has been Brazil's largest trading partner, with the latter recording a $40 billion trade surplus in 2021. The main drawback is the relationship's qualitative asymmetry. Brazil exports raw materials to China and then imports finished goods. Thus, it remains wedded to the commodities loop. To escape this export cycle, Brasilia will have to develop higher value-added industries while keeping control of its vital assets. Doing so will allow it to become the central fulcrum between Latin America and China. For now though, Brazil's primary draw card is the Amazon, which contains half the world's remaining rainforests. Its carbon sink function is crucial to climate change mitigation, yet preserving the Amazon ecosystem will impose tremendous costs on Brazil and its export-based economy. Still more complicated, Brazil has only contributed 1% of historical carbon emissions, which is why many believe that it is unreasonable to ask it to forgo economic self-interest to bail out wealthy countries that develop their economies by burning hydrocarbons. So there are valid arguments on both sides. But since Amazon management is a global problem, some lawmakers have pitched a middle ground in the form of climate reparations or funding ecological projects. Whatever is decided, it has to happen sooner rather than later. The Amazon ecosystem is nearing the tipping point where trees cannot grow back. Beyond this point, the rainforest will degenerate into a savanna. Should that happen, the resulting damage to the world's biosphere would render any debate over the climate bill moot, leaving only argument over who gets to be the wealthiest state on the cinder. In sum, Brazil's rough physical geography has hampered its development, while reinforcing its extraction-based economy. 
the resulting pockets of influence frustrated national development while promoting regionalism and opening avenues for foreign interference. And yet, Brazil is still the most powerful state in South America, with the diplomatic credentials to be a globally respected middle power in the future. But that belief has been true for the last 200 years. The future has become the present and the country has yet to live up to its ambitions. Brazil, it seems, is the country of the future and always will be. I've been your host Shirvan from Caspian Report. We've added new perks to our Patreon. You can now download all original maps by Caspian Report for personal or business side projects with no watermarks and totally copyright free. You can also join our conversations in Discord and our PDFs include more reading material. You'll find the link to our Patreon in the description. Thank you for your time and so on.